Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Andrew Campbell. I'm the Cultural Affairs Administrator for the City of West Hollywood. And on behalf of the city and our fabulous One City, One Pride programming, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Uh, West Hollywood does a, a tremendous amount of programming during Pride Month. We call it 40 Days of Pride and under the banner, One City, One Pride. Out in the front, you will see a, a, a booklet like this that has a number of events that are still yet to come. So I hope that you will take one and take a look at what we have available. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that, that in this book, we also have a special discount for the uh, Robert Maplethorpe and other exhibits at LACMA. So that's a really nice thing. It's a wonderful show if you haven't seen it yet. So please, uh, uh, make sure that you grab one of these before you leave. They're in the uh, in, on the table out in the lobby. Um, a couple of quick uh, housekeeping things. Uh, if you did park in our five-story structure over here, uh, we will validate your parking, and that happens out in the lobby. And I think that should be about it. By the way, we are uh, going to be uh, broadcasting this through our uh, WeHo TV, so uh, we're very excited about that as well. Um, Tonight we have a wonderful West Hollywood treasure, and that is the author Felice Picano, who has uh, lived in West Hollywood since 1995, but has been around a little bit longer than that in life. Um, he is uh, an author originally from the East Coast, been published since 1975, more than 30 books. Uh, he, he's a playwright, a screenwriter, an essayist, a poet, a memorist, and as I mentioned earlier, a true West Hollywood treasure. So he's going to share with us some wonderful stories tonight. And uh, following uh, his presentation, there will be time for some Q&A. There's also, uh, we, he has uh, copies of his books in the back. And uh, those would be available for purchase and also for, I'm assuming, signing. So without further ado, Feliz Picano. It works, okay. Um, thank you, Andrew, and um, thanks to Michael Che and Ellie Manzanero and all the people of the city of West Hollywood for um, actually allowing me to put on this presentation. Um, it's something that I had been doing at various colleges and historical societies in uh, Northern California, and when I got the go-ahead to do it here, I expanded it, and as you will see, I actually put captions on some of the uh, articles and I was lucky in that um, I was also uh, because of I do one of the things that I do besides uh, writing books is that I also edit them for publication um, and I'm especially uh, involved in editing for publication books by people of my generation whoever we are and uh, who are not necessarily writers but who want their stories told in many cases, there are people who are not professionals. Um, and so, it, to me, it's very important that we get our history out here. Um, I'm lucky in that this is a bit of history that goes, which is, goes beyond all of us in this room. And so, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Thanks for coming. I hope this will be an informative and fun presentation. I seem to have been preparing for many decades for this particular presentation without exactly knowing that I was doing it. Although I'm best known as a novelist, playwright, and recently a memoirist, I actually came out to Hollywood in 1977 to work for Cary Grant's Brute Productions, which had optioned my second novel, Eyes. After some months, that project fell through, but I was asked to remain and work on other film projects, which I did. At that time, uh, it was he and his wife, Diane Cannon, who owned uh, Brute Productions. I left in 1978 to publicize my third novel, which was just being published, but more importantly, I left to do research in Manhattan for my fourth novel, which many of you may already know by now, The Lure, and that actually required me going undercover for a period of months, uh, working in gay bars and clubs in Manhattan and around Manhattan to pick up material to write that book. I returned in the 1980s to Hollywood, working directly with director Frank Perry. You might know him from David and Lisa and Mommy Dearest. He had again optioned my novel Eyes. He and I wrote a script together, 
and I remained here for another period of time. I was openly gay since before the Stonewall Riots of 1969, and as an openly gay author, I met, interacted with, and was befriended by many Hollywood and many New York-based actors and writers, straight and gay. Among them were Farley Granger, Jack Larson, who you would know as Jimmy Olsen on TV's Superman series, his partner James Bridges, Tab Hunter, actresses Gloria Stewart, Loretta Young, Leonard Bernstein, Ned Morum, Charles Henry Ford, Don Bacardi, Erwin Shaw, Harold Robbins, and a nephew of Howard Hughes. I meet people easily. <laughs> and this is an example of, just an example of some of the people that I met very, very easily in those years that I was working here. So this talk is based on some research that I did and also what they told me first and second hand. And it's interesting that as soon as people knew that there was an openly gay author in town, they wanted to meet me and they wanted to talk, and they did. I wish that I had the sense when I was in my 30s to tape record them or, or take all the stuff down, but I got enough material into my journals. So, Gay Hollywood in the Golden Age. Several unfortunate events, the economic depression of the early 30s, the rise of Hitler and fascism in Germany, and the establishment of the Hayes Code of Behavior in film in Hollywood led to a surprising efflorescence of gay and lesbian ideas, talent, and artists, among those we now con consider to be the cream of Hollywood's golden age. So this happened by itself. While they were an obviously elite set of people, their words and their images have, via movies, TV, and advertising, influenced several generations worldwide of all classes, and I believe that it increased the openness that led to Stonewall and the other um, parts of gay liberation and to what acceptance we have now of LGBTQ people. I put together this PowerPoint presentation when I was going around publicizing my book, 20th Century Unlimited, two novellas, which is what we see here. Um, in one of the two stories in that book, Wonder City of the West, while hiking, a retired man encounters someone who claims he's traveled back in time from the 22nd century. He offers our narrator a, a chance to do so too. He accepts that he ends up in 1935 Los Angeles, aged 18 years old, but knowing what a 65-year-old knows in the 21st century. While I was writing, I had to see for myself what the city looked like back then when it was being publicized as the wonder city of the West. Naturally, I'm writing a novel. I want to see what it looked like. While researching, I found hundreds of photos in the LA Public Library also changes of names and places. So for example, what we know of as Fairfax Avenue was then Crescent Avenue. And a lot of streets either didn't exist, existed as longer streets, had different names, different places. There were entire areas that we know of now, which we would be surprised to find how different they were. So these photos, which I'm gonna begin with, are courtesy of the LA Public Library. By the way, there are literally thousands of Ansel Adam photos there. Um, so although he's best known for his nature photos, especially those of Yosemite Park, Adams took hundreds of black and white pictures of Los Angeles during the 1930s and 1940s. Okay, so did this piglet give birth to the tail of the pup? Maybe. Theme restaurants were common during this early period. Does this look familiar? This was the first one I ever visited in 1964. It was taken down in the mid-60s to become the Westfield Century City Mall. That's where it was. This is Wilshire Boulevard, the original Brown Derby restaurant. Two more of them were built, one right in downtown Hollywood and one downtown Los Angeles. Health nut actress Terry Moore, whom you might remember from the movie Mighty Joe Young, sailed into this one in 1956, announcing, hi kids, I've just had a high colonic. 
This is an Ansel Adams photo of Pershing Park and the Biltmore Hotel. The Academy Awards were held in this hall's ballroom until World War II. They were not on the radio, never mind televised, and they were a business affair and even a family affair. They were quite small. This is an Ansel, oops, let's go back. This is an Ansel Adams photo of a typical chinoiserie building. The location is downtown Hollywood. And in that period, what we know of as Chinatown, just to the east of downtown LA, was only just beginning to adopt chinoiserie. Santa and the reason for this is that Santa, Santa Barbara's Chinatown was destroyed by the earthquake in 1925 and then by anti-Chinese riots right after that. So it was a fresh memory in many people's minds. So many of the LA's Asians were naturally cautious about stylistically advertising their presence. And Chinatown was quite dull for many years. This looks familiar, right? Okay. The Fox Theater chain spire to the left and the RKO Skouris Theater to the right. At that point, Fox was still only a uh, movie distribution network. It was not yet a studio. And the reason that these two buildings were put up was because as West LA and the new UCLA University were the local neighborhoods where there were many previews of bigger films and specialized films. In my novella, Wonder City of the Nest, teen movies are previewed here on Saturday afternoon, which was common for the time. This, believe it or not, is the Sunset Strip in the 1930s, late 30s. Later on and through the 40s, the French mansard look would come in. Those of you who've lived here for a while would remember what that looked like. With its classy two-tone gray shades and arches that you drove under to get in back of the shop's parking lots. The style was prevalent west of Highland Boulevard, and it lasted right through the 1970s. There are a few examples of that mansard style can still be seen west of Doheny Drive. I remember it well. Now, here's something you probably won't see and probably don't understand what it is. Does anybody know what this is for? Tuberculosis was still the largest, largest medical killer in the United States. And it would be until after World War II when penicillin became readily available to citizens, civilians and citizens. Many businesses made getting a TB test via a fluoroscope a requirement before they hired you in the 30s. So the way we have drug testing now, they had TB testing. And this was a X-ray fluoroscope parlor. This is a big city street. Deliberate attempts to urbanize Hollywood from the town of wooden villages and Victorian houses that you still see in silent films meant streets like this suddenly proliferated. Filmmakers then took advantage of them to make them into any city streets in films, shooting low so you wouldn't notice the tall palm trees. You know this building? That's the, this anchored the Miracle Mile, right? By the 1930s, Western Avenue, the eastern Hollywood frontier of Los Angeles, had been far surpassed. The Miracle Mile of shops with the Central Boulevard corridor was anchored by Bullocks at one end and with the 1940 maze in full Art Deco style on the western terminus. It's now Museum Row, and this has become a much filmed street. This is pre-war Sunset Boulevard at Crescent Heights Boulevard, unrecognizable now, but behind the new corner mall with movie theaters and gyms and Trader Joe's, some of the larger 1930s Hollywood, West Hollywood courtyard and Art Deco buildings still flourish. Schwab's drugstore, where Lana Turner was supposedly discovered, was also located here, right next to that building, right next to the Coca-Cola sign in the 1940s. Park La Brea, believe it or not. <clears throat> in the 1920s and 1930s, it was oil fields. The housing development was one of two identical ones. The other one is called Park Merced in southwest San Francisco, just south of San Francisco State College. 
these were outgrowths of the 1930s architectural ideas of Frank Lloyd Wright and Otto Kahn, who wanted to do true city planning. The oil fields were owned by the Gilmore family, who owned the Gilmore Bank and the Farmer's Market. Something is still underground, as is noted by Park La Brea residents, when all the tars and gases come up between the sidewalks. This was the 1930s Art Deco City Hall, actually 1928. John Parkinson and John C. Austin's iconic Art Deco building was made famous by postcards and by being pictured upon the colorful decals of boxes of grapes, oranges, and lemons shipped all over the United States from Southern California. But it became more famous when Martians destroyed it in the 1950s film, War of the Worlds. This team also did the LA Colum Coliseum, Union Station, Grand Central Market on Broadway, and many other buildings. Pershing Square. Two of Biltmore saloons became gay male hangouts during the 1930s and especially during World War II. The action often extended into the park itself. John Retchie made this cruising ground infamous in his 1963 book, City of Night. This is another iconic building. It was the pre-war -sun pre Sunset Bowling Center. It was first put up by the Warner Brothers in 1918 and expanded around the time that they released the jazz singer. When the studio moved to Burbank, it became the offices of Looney Tunes. Hard to believe, but what now adjoins the Wilshire County Golf Course in Hancock Park, put up in 19, was still open land in the 1930s and full of riding trails. Someday, check out the adjoining residential areas. I used to bicycle through it all the time. You'll see those huge houses nearby have tennis courts and yes, even stables. Studio promo photo. Most of what I'm gonna be showing you is studio promo photos and that's important because this is what the studios themselves put out. Good, clean Anglo-Saxon boys, Louis Mayer declared, looking at these photos. The entire new promotional emphasis on healthy young men and women together was in reaction to the heterosexual excesses of Hollywood in the 1920s with its various sex, drug, and murder scandals. These culminated in the murder trial of Fatty Arbuckle and the subs subsequently instituted Hayes Film Code of Behavior. Here they are again, clean, healthy, masculine men. Lovers from the mid-30s and according to an unpublished memoir called The Peach by Dennis Dolph, the two either continued to meet or began meeting again two late afternoons every month at the Beverly Hills Polo Lounge and then would go off to a rented suite there right up until Scott's death in 1988. At home. These are all studio promo photos, right? The promo department dubbed their Malibu colonial that the men shared Bachelor's Paradise. What did he know? The two actors each married heiresses at this time. Scotts was a DuPont who seldom left the East Coast. Grants remained in New York and then Europe. When I worked for, Bert, for Brute Productions in 1977 and I was leaving to write a gay novel, Grant told me, quote, I used to be gay, unquote. William Haynes, wisecracker. From the beginning of the talk is until 1933, Billy Haynes was the number one male box office star in Hollywood, in part based on his screen character, Wisecracker, who had the guts to say anything to anyone. Studio chiefs, however, balked at Haynes painting the town with his longtime lover, Billy Shields. When Haynes refused to be closeted by marrying a woman, he was fired and then blackballed from Hollywood. Haynes began his own studio, Poverty Pictures, but it failed, and he joined Shields as an interior decorator. They were so successful that Nancy Reagan used them for the governor's mansion. They are buried together at Santa, Santa Monica Cemetery Crypt. The young Joan Cronford, Billy Haynes' companion. 
If all you know is the tough, broad shoulders ramrod Joan Crawford of later years, you'll be surprised to know that she was the Lindsay Lohan of her, her generation. She openly drank, swore, traveled around town with gay men, and allegedly kept her cottage door open for UCLA play, football players. This photo and many others show how truly classically beautiful she was. And if you can find it, check out a book called Four Fabulous Faces, where you see many other studio photographs of her. George Kukor, film director. Has anybody heard this name before? Okay, some of you have. He came from Broadway in 1930 to become the highest paid film director in Hollywood. He proceeded to make instant classics, Academy Award winners, and cult movies. He was never closeted, but always worked because he had the golden touch in movies. Little known fact is that Clark Gable supposedly had him fired from the set of Gone with the Wind because he was so openly gay. In fact, Kukor directed every scene that Gable is not in, and, because, and he was paid significantly more than Victor Fleming, who got the screen credit and the uh, uh, Oscar for it. Kukor is the most commercially successful and award-winning director of all time, with 23 nominations and six Best Director wins. Among his 67 films were, are you ready? Dinner at Eight, Little Women, David Copperfield, Romeo and Juliet, Camille, The Women, The Wizard of Oz, Gaslight, Born Yesterday, Gone with the Wind, Pat and Mike, Lust for Life, Adam's Rib, Judy Garland's A Star is Born, The Philadelphia Story, and My Fair Lady. Unbelievable. His home was for decades one center of gay and lesbian Hollywood. The young Howard Hughes. Over six feet tall, lanky, handsome, and openly bisexual. He took out a patent on the engine over the crossbars motorcycle that we have used ever since, and so he was a millionaire before he was 18 years old. He then inherited Hughes Tool and Die, which patented the oil drill bit that is still used today. In 1933, when the American average worker took home $3,400 annually, Hughes was raking in over a million dollars a month. We only know the later Hughes, the tortured germaphobe. The earlier one was a major player in Hollywood. RKO Pictures and Trans World Airlines turned him into one of the first billionaires in world history. This is a used studio promo photo of the young Buster Crabb, who as far as I know was straight, but I don't know. According to Hughes' nephew, Hughes always kept two apartment buildings in West Hollywood, filled with potential stars and more importantly, sex partners. One for young men and another for one young women. His taste in both was so well known that agencies, agents would secretly troll the buildings for new talent. When he made The Outlaw, the movie that made Jane Russell f famous, Hughes was dating Jane Russell and two of her male co-stars, Jack Butel and Gene Rizzi. Jane's carefully Hughes-constructed cleavage became famous, but among some circles, so did Butel's very obviously constructed package when he played Billy the Kid in the movie. Does anybody know what this is? Besides what it says, you remember it. Okay, not many people do. Fox was still only a theater chain when they built this, but MGN financed it, specifically to have event movie premieres. It was constructed on a big lot not far from Beverly Hills on San Vicente Boulevard, with room in front so that stars who lived nearby could easily pull up in their limos to the left and walk the very first red carpet. Waiting on the left would be some 300 radio and newspaper reporters, columnists, and gossips who would then write up the stars. To the right was a section for cheering fans to gather. Greta Garbo and Frederick March was the first to premiere there in 1935's Anna Karenina. Many of us have seen this. Now, does it look even more familiar? If you've been there, you've seen it on Main Street or even been in it to see a movie. 
copied after the original, which was savagely to torn down in Carthay Circle. No one seems to know if it was copied inside or not. The original's in theater, original in theater uh, interior was pretty fabulous, is what I'm told. Greta Garbo. The number one box office glamour queen, Greta Garbo. Among friends, she referred to herself as he and asked to be called him. She dressed in men's clothing, including farmer's dream jeans. Private mail to her was addressed to Mr. Mr. Gustafsson, which was her real surname. The studio fabricated romances between her and matinee idol John Gilbert, who told friends, and this is a quote that I got, if I were interested in men, I'd marry Greta in a minute. She was part of another circle of gay life, screenwriter, screenwriter Salka and Bertolt Vietel's home in Santa Monica Canyon, where Christopher Isherwood first made contact with the film industry, as did Jack Larson, director James Bridges, actors Monty Cliff, James Dean, etc., etc. The Viertel's two sons both became writers, and they married the actresses Deborah Carr and Virginia Ray. Garbo dated many women, including writer Mercedes Acosta, whose other lovers included Dietrich Isadora Duncan and Ava La Gallienne. Quite a group, almost as starry as my own. <laughs> Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn. Hepburn was already a star when she bought the rights to the novel Sylvia Scarlet and gave it to MGM to produce. She introduced the young British vaudeville, vaudeville actor Archie Leach as the cocky pickpocket in the film, transforming him into Cary Grant. She surrounded herself with gays and lesbians in the film, and she wore men's clothing throughout the movie. It was in the script. After this, she began to wear tailored men's suits offset all the time. She's quoted as saying, if you obey all the rules, you miss all the fun. Cary Grant and Marlena Dietrich. Dietrich made her name as a sex goddess in Joseph von Sternberg's, Sternberg's German film, The Blue Angel, based on Heinrich Mann, yes, Stomach Mann's brother, best-selling novel. She came to the United States in 1929 from UFA Studios in Berlin, along with a slew of other Germans who would help shape Hollywood's greatest films and also its laissez-faire attitude toward sex and homosexuality. Among them, von Sternberg, F.W. Murnau, Conrad Veidt, Ernst Lubitsch, Michael Curtis, William Dieterle, Otto Preminger, Peter Lorre, and Billy Wilder, all Germans escaping Hitler. For the film Blonde Venus, Dietrich was already out in Hollywood by this time, and she clashed with macho actors like John Wayne in the movie Pittsburgh and Gary Cooper, she had Sternberg make up Gary Cooper with lipstick and eyeshadow for Morocco. And if you look at the movie, you'll see in two scenes, he's wearing lipstick and eyeshadow. She preferred gay and bisexual co-stars like Grant, Randolph Scott, Monty Cliff, and Maximilian Schell, who became close friends. In his memoir, Arthur Lawrence, who did Gypsy, West Side Story, The Way We Were, recalls them after a Hollywood ceremony, a Hollywood Oscar ceremony. She was, he writes, a vision dressed in pink frou-frou from head to toe. When they entered Ciro's nightclub, a woman bumped into her and Dietrich grabbed her arm hard and asked Lawrence, should I bust her in the chops or should I be a gentleman? <laughs> Marlena Dietrich, tuxedo wearer. Several years ago, the LA Times Sunday style section headline read, the return of the tuxedo and this was the photo they used full page. Dietrich Garbo and Hepburn wearing men's clothing and taking on strong female role in films introduced slacks for women into fashion and allowed women to think of themselves as independent and empowered. When I spoke to Dietrich by phone in 1988 in Paris, she said she only had one love affair with a man after she dumped her husband in 1925. It was with French actor Jean Gabin 20 years later. She explained, it was the end of World War II. He was a resistance fighter. I was a pushover for a hero.
Katharine Hepburn's tailored summer suit. When required to wear a dress by a studio mogul for an Oscar ceremony, she balked until he offered to pay her handsomely to do it. At the party afterwards, she went up to him and said, I did it, now I'd like to see you get around in one of these get-ups. Hepburn's forbidden love, Spencer Tracy. Tracy was married and no known to be an ardent Roman Catholic but he was also known to haunt the local docks looking for merchant marines and Navy seamen to have sex with, seafood in the gay parlance of the time. He was pulled out of scrapes by studio detectives several times each year. To diffuse rumors about him and about Hepburn, the studio promo departments cleverly devised a forbidden love scenario for the two of them, who after all were pretty electric on the screen saying they could not marry because Tracy's wife would not divorce him. Thrown together so much, the two actors became actually very close in later years. The funniest pictures in 10 years. Knowing what we now know about Tracy and Hepper on this advertisement is even funnier. If you always do what interests you, Hepper said, at least one person is pleased. If you've seen the movie Hail Caesar by the Cohen brothers, which by the way, I recommend highly, you will recall Tinda Tilda Swinton as an astringent gossip columnist who attempts to out the actor played by George Clooney. This was based on a famous incident in which, goaded by the Catholic League of Decency, Hedda Hoppe attempted to out a group of actors and actresses they had gathered, that she had gathered information on and that the Catholic League of Decency wanted outed. The first and most, most notorious pair were, and here we have a studio, photo, studio promo photo, of Roland Gilbert and Constance Bennett. Constance Bennett was a major star of the 1930s in comedies and musicals, Stage Door, Gold Diggers of 1935, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She was always the debutante but with sort of a wise-cracking attitude, very popular. Gilbert, known to his gay friends as Amigo, or friend, was a Mexican-American who became more famous as an actor in his later years, and in fact, he won an Academy Award for The Old Man in the Sea, a book by um, Ernest Hemingway that he bought, adapted, and produced for the film. Early on, Gilbert was popular in Hollywood for his genital endowment and for his willingness to share it with any gender. Together, he and Constance ba Bennett bagged several millionaires who she then married and then outlived, including the French champagne heir Lulu La Falaise. Connie and Amigo would be forced to marry as part of the Hedda Hoppe bisexual scare in 1941 but they were apart again by 1943. Robert Taylor and Barbara Stanwyck, another prominent bisexual couple who would be forced to marry as part of the Hedda Hapa bisexual scare in 1941, but also were divorced a few years later. Taylor was already world famous by then. He brought Stanwyck in as his social beard and then, when she had screen tested so well, he brought her in as his leading lady. This is the way Hollywood worked in the 30s. You know, you would bring somebody in as your companion. If they screen tested well, they became your leading lady, your leading man. You know, it was so inbred, you know. Um, also, she was important because she wouldn't fall for him in real life, as so many of his actresses did, and make life difficult for him. They divorced quickly. Her talent and, talent and her moxie meant that she soon developed her own career in film and on television, I'm sure some of you remember that, and did later in, life, in, later, did later in her life to hide her sexual inclinations. She had some very public tiffs with girlfriends. George Montgomery and Dinah Shore. The very handsome Montgomery was straight but wildly adulterous. 
He just escaped being named as a correspondent in several big star named divorces and had to be bailed out of high profile brawls with outraged husbands. He was paired by Studio Public Relations with, quote, America's new sweetheart, the upcoming singer, actress, Dinah Shore, who had just made her name in the movie with Bing Crosby called White Christmas. She needed a beard, meanwhile. They too married as a result of the Hedda Hoppe scare, but they remained together for over 20 years, having two daughters. Each also had solid television careers in later years. Dinah later told Loretta Young, who told me, that it was, quote, the perfect marriage. We went everywhere together. George was free to pursue married women, and I was free to pursue single ones. <laughs> it's mad. Here's another studio promo of Burt Lancaster, and I wrote shirtless as usual, because if you go online and hit Burt Lancaster photos, you'll get many photos, and if you hit shirtless, you'll get many, many more photos. He was very proud of his body, which was a very good one. The handsome, athletic, Irish-American star with the 40-carat grin was married often and had rumored affairs with female actresses, but some, like Deborah Carr, reported that he was far too rough. Not Bert's gay buddies, however, like Amigo, Gilbert, with whom he shared dozens of younger men in threesomes. Dennis Doff, in his memoir, The Peach, reports meeting Lancaster at Columbia Screen Jams when he worked, went to work for them in New York City in 1960. He, they had sex immediately in a screening room and then for years thereafter. He said that Bert's body was still that of a hard-muscled 30-year-old well into his 60s. When Lancaster's career floundered in the United States, he went to Europe where he became an even bigger international star in films like Lucino Visconti's The Leopard and Bernardo Bertolucci's 1900. So he had a big career. And then they were the secondary actors in the Astaire Rogers movies. We all remember them, right? The fluttery, obviously gay Edward Everett Horton, who was always sort of on the side, and who, by the way, has a street named after him in Encino. But there was also no-nonsense Alice Brady, who always wear a hair pulled back like this, and who was often Ginger Rogers' friend. Brady said in one movie, you're beginning to fascinate me, and I resent that in a man. Would it have been okay in a woman? Oops, let's see if I can get this again. Going back to the top. Okay, so this is the end of uh, the presentation, and I thank you for listening. You were very good listeners. And Okay, we got it again. Um, so now we're gonna have a, a question and answer period. I'm sure I've come up with so much stuff <laughs> that you might have questions about uh, what I've reported here. Anybody have a question, Comments? let me know so I can get you on, uh, on the microphone. Oh, I'm okay, right here. here we go. Hi, um, did you ever hear anything on the uh, Hollywood grapevine about Catherine Hepburn's uh, hook up with uh, Betty Page? With who? With Betty Page. I did, but I never got details. There's a wonderful biography by William Mann um, who recently won a, um, I think he won the, the Edgar Allan Poe Award for a detective mystery set in Hollywood. Um, I think it's just called Hepper and Her Life. And it's very detailed and it talks about her life. I actually met her once uh, very late in her life. I was with a friend who was a publisher in New York and she was looking for a house in Connecticut to buy. And we went looking in various high rent areas. Um, and in one of them, there was a woman gardening um, next door. And you know, we said hello as we passed her and then walked in and looked at the house and everything. And as we, sh we came out, she stood up and she said, 
sewer problems. And she was shaking like this, and it was Catherine Hepburn. We couldn't believe it. <laughs> it was so hard. I was told that she was alone toward the end of her life and that she preferred being alone and that she really didn't like living with other people. And the same thing seemed to be true of Garbo also, who liked living by herself too. That's what I was told. Okay, we have another one here. In your, <clears throat> in your pictures of the uh, older buildings or locations, did the uh, Garden of Allah come into it? Uh, he's asking about the Garden of Allah and uh, in your pictures that you were showing earlier. There were pictures of it and I could have put it up. You know, it's where, um, um, it's, the building is still there, or the, the building that replaced it is still there. The Garden of Allah was put up, um, by, who was it, by Dorothy L'Amour originally? I, th I believe so, yeah. Allah Nazimova. Who was it? Allah Nazimova. Okay, so it was put up originally as a sort of spa. It's on Sunset Boulevard um, on the south side, almost opposite the, um, what's the hotel there? The hotel, the Chateau Maumont. And the building, there is a, a courtyard there that's still there and an outbuilding of it is now some sort of a restaurant. Um, but it was there and right down the block was Ciro's from there, which was another hangout. Um, and I don't know when it was taken down, that whole area got redone during the uh, 70s, and just a lot of things were torn down from there. There are many photos. Uh, if you go ever go into the Durant Library, by the way, do you know where that is on Sunset Boulevard? They have inside there a bunch of photos right in the lobby of what their area looked like with that French mansard style that I was talking about. And because the original library, which was put up, I think in 1939, there was exactly in that style. So they have a lot of photos of that area. I, I, I remember a lot of that style in a lot of those buildings. I never saw the original Garden of Allah. It was shuttered for many years um, and, then, and then taken down, I guess. We have a question here. Uh, you mentioned an unpublished book about uh, Cary Grant and Randall Scott. So I guess my question is, why is it unpublished? And what else do you know, or what else can you tell us about their relationship? Um, he worked for Screen Gems. He went there in 1961, 62. And he worked there during Columbia's heyday. Funny girl. Um, they shoot horse, I mean all the stars, it was like a, a huge period for Columbia. And then um, Columbia decided to move their New York offices to Hollywood, and so they brought them there. One of the, so they, everybody moved back to Hollywood or to Hollywood for the first time. What was interesting about the, the place was that there were a lot of independent producers there. So Burt Lancaster had his offices there and his production company there. Otto Preminger had his there, Roland Gilbert. And so that was New York in the 60s and 70s, which was for a lot of uh, bi and uh, gay stars, a much more swinging place than Hollywood. When I came out here in 77, for the first time, it was like nobody paid. I mean, it was everybody who was gay was totally closeted, you know. And my running around so openly, as I said, it attracted people who told me stories and things. But I mean, nobody else was doing it, you know. And nobody ever referred to it, except when I was leaving Brute Productions when Gary, when Gary, Gary Grant said what he said. Um, so this book is still being written, as a matter of fact. Um, I got it last fall, I read through it and did a first edit on it and made some suggestions, f having nothing to do with the sexuality of it, but having to do with structure and some other things. And in fact, I just heard from him that he's finished with it now, and he will be looking for a publisher. 
and he outs lots and lots of people in it, in the book. Um, he was a tall, handsome, blonde, smart young man, originally from Portland, Oregon, and they called him The Peach, which was the name of the book. Um, and, he, um, and he just got around. So Mr. Picano, you're being a little coy here. Um, have you had, can you share any of your personal experiences? Say what? Any of your personal experiences in Hollywood? With movie stars? No, you know, I didn't. I was, like I said, I was out, like, really early here. So I was going to, like, the bars, the bars, and all of that. So, you know, people wouldn't be seen dead with me, you know, who were <laughs> famous. No, really. I mean, that's the truth. You know, I made no bones about it. Um, and so it really allowed me to live my life the way I was living it on the East Coast and going back and forth, I was able to do it too. Interestingly enough, there were a lot of um, gay men, especially in PA positions, that's um, producer's assistant, right? Which meant that once you got past the secretary or the receptionist, um, it was very easy if you were gay to get through to the producer or the director because there was, you know, there was sort of what, what um, Winston Auden called a homin turn, the um, international conspiracy of homosexuals. And, and so it really was very easy and I never had trouble meeting anybody, even in later years when I came out here, everybody said, and I was amazed by this because I thought I was just a novelist. What the hell did they, I had a couple of bestsellers, but still. And they said, oh yeah, we know your name, we know who you are. You know, um, but um, I did not have any kind of uh, personal things, which is all the, the remarkable that suddenly when I started writing this book, which came to me, by the way, I did not look for this. The way I work is that I get an idea, I start writing it. If it continues, I continue writing it. And then usually around halfway through, I panic and say, oh my God, I know nothing about this subject, I know nothing about the material, I've gotta go research it, and so I start doing that. And that's what I did with, um, with this book, which is back there for sale, called 20th Century Unlimited. There are two time, uh, odd time travel stories. One of them is set in 1940s architecturally famous house in, Midwest, in the Midwest in Wisconsin. Um, and the other one is um, Wonder City of the West in which this guy goes back 1935 to um, Hollywood and Los Angeles and finds all kinds of things that are completely different. So for example, where CBS television studio is today, which was also Gilmore property, there was a football stadium and also a um, B, B, you know, um, minor league baseball stadium there, and there were teams that played there all the time. Just south of what we think of as Mid-City, um, abutted by what is now called Airdrome Avenue, Airdrome Boulevard, Airdrome Avenue, was an enormous um, airfield where people like Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks had their planes. That's where their planes were kept. Um, and that's the reason why Airdrome is named Airdrome. You would go down Crescent Avenue, which we know of as Fairfax, and then turn on to Airdrome, and there was the airfield, right? So there's a lot that actually changed. The city changed enormously over a period of years. And while I was researching it, and then it is what happened during World War II. And if you look at the photos that Ansel Adams did, you'll, you'll see some remarkable things. For example, you know, there were all these airplane factories all around this area, right? And they were very busily making um, airplanes, fighters and bombers during World War II. But this area in particular was very afraid, especially after Pearl Harbor of a Japanese invasion. And when I first started coming here, um, very early on in the 60s, there were still gun emplacements all along the Pacific Palisades and also where the cliffs are falling down on Santa Monica, all there, there were gun emplacements there. And if you go up further to the coast and even in San Francisco, there are still huge gun emplacements up there 
those were all set up to defer Japanese submarines and battleships. And what they did with the airplane factories, which were so huge, they covered them over completely with wooden frames so that they were hidden. And they put streets up there with houses and cars. And actually, people were living up there above the factories so that if an airplane happened to come over, a Japanese airplane happened to come over looking for an airplane factory to bomb, it would not find the factory. So it's sort of remarkable what, you know, what our past was, was like and how different things are now. Any other questions? So, He's asking if you I, can I don't know if we have time read a passage from your new book. Yeah. You want me to read a passage from the new book? Okay, hold on a second. All right, for those of you in TV land, there's a slight pause as uh, Mr. Picano retrieves the book that he'll read from. And he is returning. <laughs> it's gonna take a minute to, uh, to find something, but. <clears throat> Okay, so this guy gives up his name completely. By the way, if, if any of you have seen the Stephen Hawking um, genius series on PBS, he, ta have you, he talks about can you go back in time and he shows how you cannot actually go back in time. But you actually c could go back in time if you went in back in time before you were born, right? And that's what happens to this person who was born in the 40s and goes back to the 30s and immediately adopts a different name and a different career and everything. So it actually happens to him. But this is how he does it from the beginning. So he's walking up this enormous hill, which is what I was doing for a while there. And um, he says, let's start with Ralph. I never saw it spelled out. Ralph was your ordinary gray-haired, unattracted, wire-haired Bedlington Terrier. I'd known three people in my life who have liked this breed and constantly kept them around, even though they're the ugliest dogs I know. Ralph would bark in a friendly fashion whenever I reached very near the top of Crescent Heights Boulevard, and he would wag his tail whenever I appeared, and then jump a funny little jump five inches into the air whenever I passed along the gated narrow strip of land, front yard in front of this man Morgan's house, while trudging toward the top. Then Ralph would bark and jump again and follow me again back a few minutes, which is when I finally saw Morgan standing there through an open door via a closed and locked wood iron fence. He nodded, and I nodded back until after maybe the 20th nod and half wave when Morgan called me over to his front door, still all locked up, behind which he remained, and he said hello, and he introduced himself and Ralph and asked what I was doing. Hiking, I said. Oh, so you want to stay young? Too late for that, I said. I would like to stay healthy into my old age. How old are you, he said. Maybe 55? Add 10 years, I said. No, well, you are already healthy then. If you can get up that hill at that age, guess my age, he said. About the same, I said, a little younger. I was generous. He looked older. Well, that's not right. He looked odder, not older. I'm actually over 100, he said, 116 to be exact. What's your secret, I asked, Armenian yogurt? I heard people living in some Armenian mountain towns who ate a certain yogurt all lived long lives. Well, he said, I have a little time machine. He said it with a straight face. Yeah, I said. I was waiting for the yogurt or the other shoe to drop. Yeah, and I've come back in time, he said. I was born in 1995. In the year 2061, I used my time machine to come back a century to 1961. That still doesn't explain how you're 116, I said. 
Well, I lost some years. I had age when I came back. I don't know why, but it happened. I was 66 when I left there, but when I arrived in 1961, I looked about 11 years old. I had lost a lot of my acquired age. Add up the two spans I've lived, and they total 116. This was the most interesting conversation I'd had in months. Did you bring back anything from the future, I asked. To back up that statement, I meant, but didn't say. I did, he said, you want to see it? He took me inside. He, he sat me down at a Danish modern sofa and table and went away. When he came back, he was holding out something that looked like a little transparent screen, something that you would put over the front of like a Blackberry or an iPad. He held it up to the light where it was iridescent. Then he put it on the table again. When he touched it, it spoke, and as it spoke, it sort of went away, and instead I saw a two-foot-high, pale, holographic video presentation of the U.S. Mint in Denver. And then the 3D head of a young woman appeared in one corner, and she said very clearly, Mr. Fath Paul Morgana, you have $1,799,000 on deposit at this location. She then said, this is an official mes message, May 31st, 2061. To riff, and that little video is what exactly, I asked. That's my last financial statement, he said, calmly. I see inflation continues into the future, or are you really well off? No, inflation continues. A dollar then is equal to about a dime now. He brought me a juice that looked like a pomegranate, or great, no banks in 2061, I said. No banks, everyone keeps their money in the US Mint. I was looking at the window at one of those amazing dizzying views. He meanwhile was looking at me curiously. So you keep walking up that hill and you'll live to how old, he asked. Well, I've got some longevity genes. My great aunt is 106, her brother died at 99. My grandfather and my other side made it to 97. What do you think? Barring accident, maybe 100, 105? You won't like 2050, he said. I won't? You'll hate it. You're too spoiled. War? Pestilence? Only the usual amount of those. Bad climate, I tried. Very bad climate. This area will be mostly unlivable. Because of jungle conditions? Because of wild coyotes and mountain lions and giant lizards, I said, thinking of global warning? No, because of icy roads, ice and snow, even this low. How high is this hill, 600 feet above sea level? It'll be impassable more than half the year. No one ever comes up this high in 2050. Half a year of ice in the Hollywood Hills, I asked? That's the result of global warming? You've noticed our winters have gotten colder and our summers warmer. That trend will continue. This used to be a temperate zone, not anymore. And the soon the cold will outdo the heat. California becomes a lot colder. The entire West Coast freezes up like Alaska now. San Francisco becomes unlivable, far too cold. Blizzard conditions, three months a year. Only the flatter parts of the Bay Area are all doable. Wow. While Portland, Oregon, he said, is frozen tundra. Huge packs of feral wolves, caribou, elk, polar bear make a big comeback. Whales fill up the SF Bay. My first dad used motorized sled omnibuses to go up there with his buddies and hunt big winter game. Your first dad, I said, because you had a second one when you came back in time to 1961, right? Had to. I looked 10 or 11. I had to be adopted but you catch on from the past. Some people can never get their minds around it, he said. So tell me how awful it is here in sunny California in 2050, he did. He did. Well, I said, thanks, I gotta go. I hated it back then, he said. He corrected himself, forward then. The population of this country was under 50 million and dropping rapidly every year. So as soon as the thing worked, I sent myself back to time. You invented this, I said. I helped invent it. I've got to tell you, it was the best decision I ever made coming here. I've loved living this second time in this time. People here and now complain a lot. They've got nothing to complain about. God help us, I thought. 
but you won't live till you're 2050 and then have to see it again. I said, no, he said, I don't have longevity genes in my ancestries. I've got short ones. I got maybe another five, 10 years tops. I'm actually 116, he said. So you did, okay, nice meeting you. I'll wave when I come by. Two more than wave, he said, ring my bell. As I was stepping out and still patting Ralph the dog, I figured he was a lonely old guy, so I said, sure, I'll ring your bell next time I come by. Do so, he said, I've got a very interesting proposition for you. Thank you very much. Mr. Felice Bacano, thank you so much. Uh, he has books available in the back. And again, please uh, participate in some of our remaining One City, One Pride events. More information in the back. And if anyone wants to speak to me separately, please do. <laughs>